بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ انشاءاللہ this is the third of our presentations and we will take an excursion through history starting with the Mongol invasions ending up with the dissolution uh, of the Khilafah after the uh, First World War. And the process, inshallah, will cover the emergence of the Sufi sheikhs. That was an important benchmark in Islamic history. We'll go on to the emergence of women sovereigns in Islam as to how it happened and why it happened. We'll look at the emergence of the Salafi movement. We'll take a brief look at the events in the motive, because those events have a bearing on how Europe emerged from its dark ages and ultimately came to dominate Asia and Africa, much of the Islamic world. Then the onset of colonialism and what it did to the Islamic world the fall of the Mongol Empire will take as an example so that through it we can understand some of the reasons as to why it is the way we are at the present time. Then a brief look at the reformers and then the archetypes that have emerged throughout Islamic history. A vast landscape will be brief but inshallah through it will make some sense of Islamic history. We have not produced a great historian in Islam, Islamic history, since the times of Ibn Khaldun, the great Ibn Khaldun, who came up with the idea Asabiyya, which governs the rise and fall of civilizations. Basically, the thesis of Ibn Khaldun is that in the beginning when a new wave comes into a civilization it is animated by the virtues of the desert or the virtues of village life integrity honesty courage drive and cohesiveness working together then gradually as they settle down, we become accustomed to the easy life of the cities. They lose those virtues. As they lose their virtues, they start to come apart. That was the theory of Ibn Khaldun. And he said that what holds the civilization together is Asabiya, namely the relationships between families or tribes. The difficulty with the theory of Ibn Khaldun from an Islamic perspective is that Islam is against Asabiya. All we have to do is to take a look at us here in this audience. People come here from all walks of life, all different parts of the world. The only reason that we are together is because of our faith. It is not Asabiya that brings us together. We are not related by bonds of blood. We are related by bonds of Ashadu la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That is the driver for Islamic civilization. And that is the meaning of us. Indeed, throughout time, humankind is at loss, except such as those who have certainty of faith and engage in righteous action, righteous deeds, and join together for what? And I gave a brief khutbah yesterday, but Haq is a very broad universe. It has multiple facets to it. Haq means truth. Haq means justice. Haq means what you owe and what you own. Haq means your rights and responsibilities. All of these things are in Haq. And the highest meaning of Haq is that it's the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only He is Haq. Everything else is relative. So, what we have done in here, what I've tried to do in my books, is to advance a new theory for the rise and fall of civilization. 
That was documented in this book, The uh, Islam in Global History, which was published 15 years ago. First in Pakistan, Lahore. It was sold out. Then it was published here in the United States. It's available from, uh, from Amazon.com when you're interested. There's also much of it is on the internet, www.historyofislam.com, which has been visited by more than 1.3 million people around the globe. I would advise you to take a look at it from the point of view of understanding what is the Islamic perspective on history. It is not the perspective of Toynbee. It is not the perspective of other people, namely challenges and response. Asabiya, that is not the Islamic perspective. The Islamic perspective is what is in Surah Al-Asr. One of the reasons why we fell behind is that we read the Quran, but we don't understand it. People don't read the Quran, but then when they read the Quran, they don't understand it. They read it as if it's something that needs to be done, and they do, Alhamdulillah, there is barakah that goes with it. But we need to understand every word of the Quran is a universe unto itself. Every word of the Quran is like a light, a lamp. Read it, honor it. Someone asked me, what is the reason we fell behind? It is because we don't understand the Quran. Understand it and act upon it. Live it. Because the Quran has the answers. A seminar like this ought to have 500 people. And allow me to make a comment in any case. I've been invited to a, an organization, by an organization in India on the 20th of December. They're honoring 10 well-known Muslims from all over India. There will be 10,000 people there to hear a seminar like this. Why is it that we have such such small audience? Because we don't understand the Quran. It's nothing to do with me. Nothing to do with you. I beseech everyone to read the Quran, to understand it, to act upon it. And that <coughs> is the answer. That is where we have to look. So, what happened to Islamic history in the 13th century was a great calamity. A great, great calamity. We say, in this day and age, we are under pressure. But just imagine, 65 to 70 percent of the Islamic world overrun, decimated. 90 percent of the people, this is not an exaggeration, dead. And I explained to you how is it possible for in invading force to kill 90% of the people. If you want to understand it, go to New Mexico. Look at the cities and how little small hamlets here and there. So what used to happen was that when invasion force, invading force comes in, people would huddle together within the confines of a fortress, and the fortress would all run, it's all gone. So the Mongols destroyed everything in their sight, all the way from Mongolia to Baghdad. Dams destroyed. Libraries burned. Scholars decapitated. Women enslaved. Children disappeared, burned. Gone. And the Sharia disappeared. And in its place, the Mongol Rasa took its place. What were the countries that were affected? You start with Mongolia, Western China, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan up to the river Indus, that was India at the time, Iraq, Syria. Syria means Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, Jordan, all of that was historical Syria up to Jerusalem. And then from the other side, we have the simultaneous invasions of the Crusaders. Spain, most of it was lost by the year 1248, except for Granada. So 70% of the Islamic world and the great cities that were the centers of learning disappeared. And you can look up the histories, the life stories of some of the great scholars when they died. You'll find so many of them, their lives ending between 1290 and 1221. And the others, they ran as the Mongol forces invaded, either from 
what is today Afghanistan, Central Asia, that area. One of them was Maulana Rumi. His family left the western part of Afghanistan and then went to Isfahan, then to Damascus, and finally ended up in Konya. Why? Because they were fleeing the Mongols as they were advancing from the east. And from the other, other side, Ibn al-Arabi, who was born in Spain and died and is buried in Damascus. Same reason. So, with this calamity, with the scholars gone, with the libraries destroyed, with the mosques disappeared, Islam turned to its soul. Islam turned to what was inside of it. The heart of Islam came to the rescue of Islam. We use the word Sufi, but Sufi is a historical term. It is not in the Quran. It evolved in the following way. <coughs> the spirituality of Islam was always there. The Prophet ﷺ was the embodiment of Islam, of, 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 of uh, spirituality. Abu Dhar was one of the earliest of so-called Sufis. The word Sufi is historical in origin. There are three or four different explanations of the word Sufi. Explanation number one, it comes from the word Saf, meaning cleanse. Namely, the people who have the bent of mind look for the cleansing of the heart so that the heart becomes a reflector of divine light. They remember the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and through the transformation of the heart, they seek to transform their character so that they become in turn good Muslims. That is one meaning of it. The second meaning of it is saf, to stand in line, ashab as safa. These were people who used to wait for the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet ﷺ came out of his house, these people, they would stand in line and they would follow him all the way around. They were called the ashab as safa. And whatever the Prophet did, they did. Whatever he did, they did. And that's how the Sunnah of the Prophet came. Because see, the difference between the Sunnah and Hadith is the following. Sunnah has to do with what the Prophet did. Hadith is what the Prophet said. This is the, this is the difference. Why do people fight over this? Unnecessary. What he said is important. What he did is important. There's, there should be no difference between them. I'll touch upon many important things today, and we have some young people, and I hope you'll, you'll catch the nuggets, and then go back and work on them. There's no reason to disagree. What the Prophet said, he did. When Aisha Siddiqa, Radhi Allah was asked, tell us something about the character of the Prophet. She said, he was like the Quran, the embodiment of the Quran. So what he said is important, what he did is important, and what he did not do is also important. So, the third meaning of Sufism, so-called, tasawuf, is that it comes from the word suf, which means wool. Wool, as it relates to the story of Fatima al-Zahra. It is said that as a Fatima al-Zahra would take wool, because people those days in Arabia, it does get cold at night. Those of you who have gone for Hajj and Umrah know this during the winter months. So she used to knit the uh, ropes for the family. And who was the family? Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Her husband, Hazrat Ali Radiallahu Anhu. And her children. And the Prophet used to wear the Kamali is called, Kamali Wale in Urdu, as we call it. He used to wear that rope made by the hand of Fatima al Zahra, Radi Allah Anha. And the knitting hand of Fatima al Zahra is called Suf, from the word Suf, Sufi. So it's a historical term, and don't get hung up on it. Very important. History is history. The Quran is the Quran. We should be aware of what is historical and what is the Quran. Follow the Quran. If you don't like the term Sufi, use the word Taskiyah. Mm -hmm. And what do the Sufis do? What did they do at the time? What did they do today? 
See, one of the first things that the Sufi scholars, those who were left behind, these were the people in little small hamlets. Genghis Khan did not leave the cities. Even today, as you approach Samarkand, you'll see in the approaches to Samarkand who were there one time, there's a vast area that's completely destroyed. And the mountains are still there. And in the center of Bahara, there is a monument that, that recently was built during the days of the Soviet Union, where 8,000 people were put in there in one pit by Genghis Khan and decimated. You can see the devastation even to this day in, in Central Asia. In 1221, when Genghis Khan had finished destroying the countries that I mentioned, the scholars, Muslim scholars, get, got together with Genghis Khan and briefed him on the spiritual tenets of Islam. Genghis Khan, after he left, he went back to Mongolia and his children and his grandchildren took over, but the attacks on the Islamic world did not cease. They continued up until 1295. In 1258, Baghdad was destroyed. And there developed this competition, now global competition, between the Christians, the Armenians, and the, the Buddhists for the soul of the Mongol. Central Asia used to be Buddhist. Prior to the coming of Islam, Afghanistan was Buddhist. Central Asia was Buddhist. North India was Buddhist, not Hindu is not commonly known. So the Latin West and the Church of Constantinople sent emissaries to the great Khan in Karakorum, which was the capital of the Mongol Empire, to form an alliance, joint alliance for what? To extirpate Islam, to remove it from the face of the earth. That's how bad it was. The alliance did take place. And some of the women that were sent from the Constantinople court, one of them was Doga Khatun. She became a wife of the great Khan. And in the Battle of Al Anjalu in 1262, wherein the Mongol invasions were stopped on the outskirts of Jerusalem, that's how it's about 10 miles from Jerusalem. Those of you who are from that part of the world know that. They were stopped there at the Battle of Anjalu by the Mamluks of Egypt. Had it not been for the victory of the Mamluks in 1262, the Mongols, with the help of the Armenians and the, the Church of Constantinople, might well have extirpated Islam. With the exception of Delhi, Delhi was also a Mamluk kingdom at the time, but Delhi's kingdom was only about 20 years old by the time, because Delhi had been captured by the Mamluks only in the year 1192, from 1192 to 1223, about 30 years. They were trying to settle down. In any case, the Sufis put up a fight, a spiritual fight for the soul of the Mongol. And it was a period of back and forth some of these Mongol overlords, sometimes they would become Christian, sometimes they would be Buddhist, sometimes they would be Muslim. Until finally, in the year 1296, Ghazab the Great of Persia, who was the grandson of Genghis Khan, accepted Islam. There was the tide of the turn, the tide turned in favor of Islam. And Central Asia, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, remained Muslim. And the history of the world moved on. <coughs> that was the contribution of the Sufi sheikhs in the 13th century. Again, you have to ask yourself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his way of dictating history. I'll give you for young people a, a nugget. Remember this. People get involved with debates about Hada and Hadr. Predestination versus free will. Here is a nugget for you. Both predestination and free will are valid, except that there are different planes. Free will is valid in space-time, but the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala operates at a different level of energy 
much higher level of energy which looks down upon the space-time. It is, it is, it's, it's like, for instance, to give an analogy, you take a three-dimensional building, you take the projection, the shadow of the building upon the earth, you cannot say anything about the depth of the building from the shadow. Not the height of the building, the depth of the building. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will operates at a different level. In, in the plane ad-dahr, that word is from the Quran. Whereas the will of man operates in al-asr. It's a different plane. So the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala operates through history. If you look back, leading up to the invasions of the Mongols, you will find how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared the Islamic world for the invasions. You find on the stage of history, starting with the period of Hazrat Abu, Abu, Abu Dhar, you know, Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu was even before that because he was the doorway to the knowledge of the Prophet, the source of what we call Sufi knowledge. And throughout the classical period of Islam, you had the appearance of the people who were of a spiritual bent. Al Ghazali gave an honorable place for Tasawwuf in the in the in, in the in the scheme of knowledge of of uh, um, Sunni Islam. You have the appearance of Sayyidina Abdul Qadir Jilani of Baghdad, who passed away in the year 1186. This is before the Mongol era. You have the appearance of um, in, in Turkey. Walana uh, no, no. Rumi. That was uh, 1173. He passed away in the year 1273, I should say. Imam Shaduli of Egypt, 1258, and so on. So you have a galaxy of these great Muslims of the spiritual mind appearing on the stage of history it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preparing the world of Islam to give it the life raft as he gave the life raft to, to, um, what? to Noah. He gave the life raft, historical life raft, to the Muslims, and you have the appearance of these great ships. So they carried the day, converted the Mongols, and the history of the world moved on. Then what happened was, for about 200 years in Central Asia, you have a period of turbulence, a great period of un unsettled conditions. And in these untold, unsettled conditions, you have the appearance of Taimur also. Taimur was not a Mongol. He was a Tatar. And the, Mong the uh, Mongol invasions were followed by the Tatar invasions. Taimur was probably <coughs> a, A greater conqueror, in a sense, that even Mongol in, in, than Genghis Khan. Taimur was the one who conquered Russia, all of Russia. He was he can be called the father of Russia. That's a different issue. I won't go, go into it now. He conquered Iran. He conquered India. He conquered Egypt. He conquered the <clears throat> Ottoman Empire, and he was on his way to conquering China when he died in the year 1406. In this period of 200 years, you find a great spiritual convulsion in the Middle East all the way from Afghanistan to Turkey. And out of these spiritual convulsions emerged the three dynasties that we are familiar with. The Ottomans to the west, the Samovids in Iran, and the Mughals in India. All of them out of this convulsion. Even the founding of the state of Hyderabad in the year 1496 if my memory serves me right, Khuli Muhammad, Khuli Shah. He came from that part of the world. Out of this convulsion, the spiritual convulsions that were going on, he, the, one of the Kara Khulish, and he left 
uh, what is today the uh, area between Anatolia and Iran, and he came to Hyderabad, founded your city of Hyderabad, and here you are, beautiful city. That's the origin. That's what happened. Now let's take a look a little bit about the Mughal before I go on to the Mughal Empire. It is very important to understand what happened in the Mughal because without it, we'll not understand the origin of colonialism. It is the key to the world arises from the happenings in the Mughal Summarily, the fall of Granada in 1492 freed the Latin West from the challenge of the Muslims. The Latin West in turn embarked on the conquest of North Africa and Western Africa. They established these so-called trading posts and each time they established a trading post they would take some prisoners as slaves, these were Muslims, and take them to Lisbon and sell them, the Portuguese. And the Spaniards did the same thing. The first capture of African slaves was done in the year 1426 of a Muslim family in uh, the uh, area south of Morocco, which is uh, Mauritania, 1426. By the year 1492, there were 10,000 Muslim slaves in Lisbon. And in the initial ships that came to America, there were so many Muslim prisoners. And if you look at the names of the early arrivals on the ships from, from uh, Spain, you'll find Muslim names in there, both men and women. Those names are available in the Chronicles in New Mexico. Go look them up. So, the Latin West, as they embarked on their conquest of North Africa, they ran into resistance. Now there developed a tug of war between the Latin West, the northern countries of Europe, and North Africa. What was the tug of war about? After 1492, the Spaniards came to the New World. You know the story of the New World. The Mayans, the Aztecs, the gold and the silver, how the Spaniards came here, looted it, raped and murdered and get, got rid of all the uh, people of the New World. This gold was transported aboard ships to the New World. Huge amount of gold. The value of a currency depends on the amount of gold that it has up until 1974 when we abandoned the gold standard. The value of a currency depended upon what backed it up. And we have bankers in here that will tell you that. If there is nothing to back, back up a currency, it's worth the piece of paper that is written on. So as this gold was transported from the New World to Spain, other countries, France, England, Morocco, they said, ha ha, there are these ships, and they're carrying all this gold. Now we can attack them as pirates off the coast of Africa and capture some of the gold. So the British became pirates. The French became pirates. And the Moroccans also became pirates. And some of the biggest names, like Piri, Rais, Drake, and so on that we hear about in history, emerged from these pirates. They would waylay these ships, the Spanish ships, off the coast of Africa, take the gold, capture it to their own countries. A few words about England that's very important. Why England? England was even more feudal than continental Europe up until the 14th and the 15th century. England depended upon wool, and their <coughs> social structure rested upon land. They had huge landowners, and in between two land holdings, they would have a common grazing area, and the serfs who worked in the, for the big landholders grazed their goats in the common area. And as the uh, demand from the, the demand for goods increased because of the gold infusion, many of these people left their grazing areas and congregated into the big cities of London and Liverpool and so on. So much so in the 16th century, for a while, the British Parliament even passed a law saying that 
no serf will be allowed in the city of London. They had all kinds of very harsh punishments. At one point they threatened them with even death. In any case, these serfs came to the big cities of Liverpool and London where there was an opportunity to become pirates. So England emerged out of its feudalism through piracy, capturing the gold and silver from the New World. And as they captured more and more gold, they became even more bold. Ultimately, they started to dream about trading with the, uh, with the uh, Indian Ocean areas. So, out of this tug of war between the countries of North Africa and Europe, the bottom line is here, here is, here is what happened towards the end. Towards the end of the 16th century, this is after Spain has consolidated its hold on the New World, and it has consolidated its hold on the Philippines. The British, under Elizabeth I, put up resistance. Northern Europe became Protestant. I'm sort of... Uh, summarizing the history of uh, Europe. I've written a great deal about it in the, in the books in here. Towards the end of the 16th century, three major events happened that again determined the history of the world. The first thing, there was an invasion of Morocco from Portugal in 1578. It's called the Battle of Three Kings, in which the Moroccans were victorious. Had the Portuguese been victorious at that battle, then North Africa would have gone the route of Andalus. It would have been lost to the Islamic world, and again, the uh, result would have been similar to what the Mongols were trying to achieve. Indeed, in year 1507, the Portuguese wrote a letter to the Mongol Khalifa in Cairo saying that the intent was to invade Makkah and Medina and to destroy the Kaaba. This is 1507. So they lost that battle. Secondly, in 1588, the Spaniards invaded England with the Spanish Armada. You know the result of that. They lost it. They built another Armada 10 years later. And this Armada was caught in a storm. So the gods were favoring England at the time. And so England emerged. England remained unscathed. The end result towards the end of the 16th century is the relative decline of the Latin powers and the rise of the northern European powers. Then there is again a tug of war between the Dutch and the English, and for historical reasons, the English triumphed. Out in the Indian Ocean area, similarly, <laughs> there was a tug of war between the Portuguese and the Ottoman Empire. What happened in the Indian Ocean was the following. The Muslims controlled the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean, all the way from China to the coast of Africa, was an Arabic lake. Arabic language was the lingua franca of the entire area. 70% of the GDP of the world was focused, concentrated in the littoral states of the Indian Ocean. China, India, Iran, Arabia, East Africa. There were prosperous trading centers. And it was a gentleman's agreement. These trading centers were open, in which all the peoples of the littoral states could participate and trade and prosper. Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, believers, unbelievers, all of them participated in this trade. But Arabic was the lingua franca. <coughs> and in order to accommodate the preponderance of Arabic influence, even the mighty empire of China felt it compelled to send their ships into the Indian Ocean under the generalship of Muslim sailors. The great General Ho in the year 1410. He traveled from China all the way through the Straits of Malacca, which is near Singapore today, to the uh, Bay of Bengal, off the coast of India, 
and then through the Arabian Sea to West Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope to the southern portion of Africa. At the head of ships which were 50 times larger than anything that Europe could field at the time. That's how preponderant the influence of Islam was in the littoral states. The Portuguese learned how to go from Africa to India through the work of Muslim mariners. The name of the Muslim mariner who helped, the, uh, who helped uh, Vasco da Gama was Ahmed ibn Majid. A man, a Gujarati man, who lived in Africa, who was a mariner, he had a compass. He understood where the reefs were, how to go from the area that is today Zanzibar to the uh, coast of Karamandal, which is the southern portion of India. As soon as they discovered the path to India, they became pirates once again. Vasco da Gama returned. The first trip that he made was 1496. The second one was 1506 at the head of a flotilla of <coughs> gun loaded ships and blasted all of these trading centers all the way from Shofala <coughs> in Africa through Aden and the ports of Persia to the ports of India and in the Straits of Malacca to China. Destroyed them and took over the trade. So that later in the 16th century there was a tug of war between the Ottomans who captured Egypt in the year 1517 and they became the responsible for protecting the, the, the Muslim enclaves in Asia. They put up resistance. Again, to make the long story short, the tug of war went on. It was like a world war that was fought in North Africa, Spain, Mediterranean, East Africa, off the coast of China, off the coast of Gujarat, all the way, it was fought all the way through. Up until the year 1588, the tug of war went on. And in 1588, there emerged a stalemate. The area north of Zanzibar stayed in the hands of the Ottomans, and the area south of Zanzibar stayed in the hands of the Portuguese. And so, we have a situation now Africa controlled by Portugal and Spain, Asia more or less controlled by the Muslim dynasties. And out of this political situation emerged the slave trade. And only a few words about the slave trade. It was amazing what started as a religious confrontation between Europe and the Islamic world ended up in the slavery of an entire continent. After 1492, as the Spaniards um, colonized the New World, they brought in some of the crops of the Old World into the New World. Sugar cane was one of them. It was highly profitable. They found that the natives here, the people of the New, the, the new World so-called, the native Indians, the, the, the original people of this part of the world. They were unsuited for work in the sugar plantations. And therefore, they wanted to bring in people from Africa who they thought were more suited to work in the plantations. Out of sugar, when you process sugar, you get rum. And out of rum, you get the liquor. So what happened was there was a three-way trade. Sugar, rum, and from England, and Spain and Portugal, they would take these guns and some of the manufactured goods and the rum, the go to Africa, give the Africans gun and liquor and let them fight amongst themselves so that they would bring in more slaves and slaves. Slaves, sugar, rum, guns, three-way trade. And out of this, they grew enormously rich out of the gold and silver of the New World. Simultaneously, the trade from the East, from India and Indonesia, also made them rich. Why did the Europeans want to go to India? Because in the year 1700, India accounted for 25% of the GDP of the world. When I use the word India, I'm talking about the entire area from Kabul to Dhaka and from Kashmir all the way to Mysore. That was the Mughal Empire. Most of Afghanistan was a part of the Mughal Empire. 
except for the area of uh, southern Afghanistan around Iran. Kandahar, from uh, around the area of Kandahar, which the Safavids had conquered, uh, captured from the great Mughals uh, the, after the death of uh, Akbar. So India accounted for 25% of the GDP of the world. It exported the black pepper, the Indian black pepper from the Coromandel course, which is the southern part of India, was very uh, popular in Europe. It brought a very high value. It was better than the pepper from Africa. So they came to India for two reasons. One, to get the spices, and secondly, for their wealth. The wealth of India was well known in, the, uh, in Europe. But they were so ignorant, these people. The Portuguese, for instance, did not have the vaguest idea as to where India was. They assumed that the River Nile somehow flew all the way through to, the, to, to India. And they called Southern India, India Major. Northern India, India Minor. And they thought there was a Christian king somewhere in Africa. His name was Prester John, John who was waiting for the Europeans to come in and they would form an alliance with them so that they could go and invade the Kaaba and destroy it. And they also had to believe that the, the, uh, the body of Prophet Muhammad was hung somewhere between the heavens and the earth above Kaaba. That's how ignorant they were of the Muslim world. And their intent was very simple. That's to extirpate Islam. My dear young brothers, you think that what is happening in the world today is new? Wake up. Read history. Get to know it. This is not new. This has been going on for a thousand years. It comes in different forms, in different shapes. So, towards the end of the 16th century, you have the emergence of Europe. Now comes another institution that was to transform the shape of the world the Joint Stock Company. Do not underestimate the power of the Joint Stock Company. What happened was that Spain and Portugal had monopoly on trade, slave trade, as well as trade with the New World, and most of the money, all of the money went to the kings. The English, they were more, they had more common sense. They opened up the trade. Anybody can pull in the resource, of course, the rich and even queen. Queen Elizabeth I sometimes invested in it. Anybody can invest in it and profit from the trade that they had with the New World or with India or the Far East. The Joint Stock Company enabled Europe to pull, pull resources together so that common people working together can achieve uncommon results. Working together. When all of us work together, we can achieve uncommon results. Do Muslims work together? Just look at the world today. Ask yourself, why? You put four Muslims together in a room, you come up with five parties. <laughs> why is that so? And we read the Quran, and then we feel Allah has a special place for us in heaven. But how about this earth? Why don't we read the Quran and follow it? What the law sell? Bil what is just? No. The Joint Stock Company was a step in the right direction, civilizational direction. It enabled Europe to pool its resources together so that then through those resources they could trade and ultimately project their social and political power into Asia and Africa. It took them a hundred years. But at the same time, now we come to back to Asia a little bit. While Europe is going through this transition, the conflicts in the Maghreb, which were resolved with a stalemate between North Africa and the, uh, the Latin West, and then the rise of England, the rise of the Joint Stock Company, what is happening in the East? We have the Mughal Empire, the Safavid Empire and the Ottoman Empire. These empires were great on land. Let us not underestimate their contributions. The Mughal Empire, for instance. Babur invented a bow and arrow made of composite materials. 
And those of you who don't know what composite materials are, these are space materials. For instance, when I worked on the Hubble Space Telescope, I was one of the principal designers of Hubble, we use composite materials. <clears throat> one of the properties of composite materials is that you can store energy in them. You can take care of a lot of compression, a lot of tension when there's compression. They, they are very good. He had a bow and arrow which enabled him to reach out targets much farther than the English um, bow that, that people talk about in history. And it could be fired very rapidly. They invented the matchlock made of composite materials too. The matchlock gun was known in Europe also. But the matchlock of the Mongols, Mongols was longer <coughs> and was made of super plastic material. Now what's the big deal about it? A super plastic material has a much greater resilience, greater strength, and you have a longer bore. So you have a longer time for the gunpowder to spend its energy in the barrel so that the projectile, whether it's a stone or whatever it is, has a longer distance to travel. They could shoot at 300 yards, like a sharpshooter. This was, this was the mobile, mobile empire. This was your empire. And I've spoken about the rockets up until the 18th century. The guns, the mobile guns were famous. And they were mobile. People talk about mobile artillery these days. They would carry them from place to place. The same thing was true of the Ottomans and the Safavids. But the Mughals, this is something that we know about. So these empires were great on land. But there were two areas which they neglected. One, printing press. The printing press <coughs> made its appearance in Europe in the 15th century. Europe, especially after the Protestant Reformation, all of the great ideas, thanks to the printing press, were disseminated to the general population. The printing press was not introduced into the Ottoman Empire until the year 1728. It was not introduced into India, this mobile India I'm talking about, when I say India, I mean all of South Asia, until the year 1815 or thereabouts. Why was that so? And this is something, go back to some of the questions that are constantly asked, what is, what went wrong? It's not one thing. Many things went wrong. I'm just talking about technology and I'll come back to some other issues in a minute. Printing press. The ulama were opposed to it. They said, we are not going to allow the word of God to come into contact with wood or steel. The real reason was that there was a lot of money in it. There were khatibs. There were many people who wrote by the hand, Aurangzeb himself, the mighty empire that he was, emperor that he was. 25% of the GDP he commanded, greater than the amount of relative wealth commanded by the United States of America at the end of the Second World War. <clears throat> That's how rich and powerful he was. He wrote books with his own hand. He did not bring in the printing press. Why? Ask yourself. Printing press fell behind. And therefore, the knowledge that was available from outside did not find its way into the Islamic world. Second reason, naval technology. That's also a very highly specialized subject. It is not that easy. It's not just a question of taking a gun and putting it on a, on a boat. And, no, it's not that simple. Gunpowder, when stored in a very salty environment, goes fizzle, it fizzles out. It has to be packed properly. You have to put sawdust or some other material in it so that it does not absorb water. The Europeans mastered the technology. That technology was not available in India or the Ottoman Empire. So much so that the mighty Mughal Empire to send Hajis from India to Arabia had to get the passports of the people, the documents, travel documents of the people stamped by the, by the Portuguese with a uh, an image of Isa alayhi salam and Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam. This is how bad it was. Why did they neglect naval technology? This is something that needs to be understood. 
The budget of the Ottoman Empire tells another story. In the year 1700, if you look at the, the line items of the budget of the Ottoman Empire, the amount of budget that the Ottomans had for the Navy was the same as the budget that they had for the royal kitchens. Mm. This, is the, this is the second reason. Technology. Why? There are many reasons for it. One was smugness, which also is characteristic of us today. Smugness meaning we are the best. We have nothing to learn from anybody. There is a good place for us, reserved for us in heaven. It is there. It is for us. Nobody else is going to find its way in there. Smugness. You can read about it again and again. Emperor Shah Jahan at one time made the following statement. He said, the Franks, anybody from England and, and, and Europe was called a Frank. It comes from the word Ferengi. Anyway, the Franks, he said, would be a great people were it not for three things. One, they're heathens. They, they don't believe as we do. Secondly, they eat pigs. And thirdly, they don't wash after they go to the battle. This is the emperor talking about it. And in 1728, when there was an understanding between France and, and Germany, up until that time, France was an ally of, of the Ottoman Empire. The uh, Khalifa the, the, of uh, Istanbul, he wrote back and said, well, when, when two dogs talk to each other, should we be talking to them? This was the kind of smugness that they had. We have nothing to learn from anybody else. The same kind of attitude that pervades the Muslims even today. The same kind of attitude that kept the Muslims back in the, in the 19th century that Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan fought. And when he fought, if you go to that part of India, you'll find out they call him a kafir. They call him, I mean, they, they, <laughs> smugness. That was the second reason. But the most important reason was the breakdown of morals. Let's trace our history from the time of the so-called Sufis till the arrival of the Europeans. Towards the end of the 18th century, Islamic civilization takes a turn again. I submitted to you that one way to understand history is to look, take a look at big bends. You're not going to find this material in any textbooks. No lecture is going to give you this material. This is the result of 50 years of research. Look for the bends in Islamic history. The Battle of Dibruga in the year 1656 between Darashiko and Aurangzeb was a benchmark in world history. It was then through that battle that Islamic civilization took its turn from this basis on what it was up until then, namely the heart to the mind. I'm not going to use the word Sufi and Salafi. It went from the heart to the mind, Aurangzeb won, and Aurangzeb went off on his own way. He was a great man. I'm not going to detract from his greatness. A great man in his own right. He did many great things, built up India into a superpower, but it was a detour of civilization. So Islamic civilization now has its focus on the mind, which means the outward observations of religion. It is at this time you have the appearance of Sheikh Abdul Wahab in Arabia, about the same time. When you look at history, you'll find broad scopes. There is something greater about world history than what we understand. Broad scopes. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves these winds from one side to the other. The same thing was happening in Safad Iran and Ottoman Turkey about the same time. The move to the right, if you call it. So that by the end of the, of the 17th century, by the year 1700, all three of these mighty empires were dictated to by right-wing ulama. Islam had made its turn to the right. It was this Islam <coughs> focused on the observations of the external, but bereft of the energy of the joint stock company or any other means of pulling resources together, tawasa bilhaf, tawasa bilsar, that came into conflict with the European West. And in this conflict, it was found wanting. It lost out. Because there was no mechanism. The Mughal Empire for its revenues upon agriculture. And the king gave favors, jagirs, 
and Mansabs. Kabu was a Jagir, and Agra was a Jagir, and the Marathas got Jagirs, and the Mansabs, when there was no more land to give, there was nothing to give. There was no trade. They trade because the trade was in the hands of the Europeans. There was no technology, there was no printing press. Where were the ideas? There were great craftsmen. I mentioned the bow. I mentioned the, the uh, long barrel gun. There were craftsmen. They were not scientists and engineers. Even the rockets of Mysore, if you look at them, they knew how to make them, but they didn't have the theory. Isaac Newton was a contemporary of Akbar. He lived at the time of Elizabeth I. But did we have an Isaac Newton in the Islamic world? Or since then, anybody else? Except for a few, there are some great ones. I'm talking in general terms. What I'm trying to say is that Islam took a turn to the right when Europe, especially Northern Europe, was brimming with energy, the energy of trade, the energy of the joint stock company, the energy of pooling resources together. And with no hang-ups in terms of religion, because Protestant Europe did not obey the Pope of Rome, but was fixed upon making money and world domination. They embarked upon it, and the 18th century, you know the rest of the story. India was the first great non-Western civilization to fall to the West. Not Africa. Africa was 100 years later. And with the resources of India, especially the fall of Bengal in 1757, in 1757, the British took out roughly $3 billion in three shiploads through Clive. And the following year, the uh, Industrial Revolution in England began. Was it a coincidence? No. For science, you need capital. The capital came from two sources. One, the slave trade, and the loot from India. And then, of course, there was loot for Indonesia, too. But primarily, the India, 1757, 1758. Between 1757 and 1799, when Mysore fell, England and Europe, you see this resurgence of inventions, the wealth from India, Bengal, Bihar, Delhi, the wealth from all of these areas, ultimately the fall of Mysore. The wealth, the loot from these areas financed the industrial revolution of Europe. And of course the uh, loot from the New World too. So India became poor and Europe went on its road to ascendancy. What was the response of the uh, Muslims to all of this. They recoiled. If you look at the history of India, with which we are thoroughly familiar, they recoiled. They said, how could these people overtake us and become our rulers? And after 1857, when there was the uprising, for a long time, the ulama said, we have nothing to learn from these people. Let's not even learn the English language. Let's not learn their science. And they were opposed even to the people who wanted to learn the science and the ways of the Europeans. It took a long time for our ulama to come around to it. The ulama have to change. If Islam has to change, the ulama have to change. We have to teach them not just the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. We have to also teach them science and history and something about the nature of man. That's where change comes from because they have a responsibility, they have the authority, they are the guides. They have to learn. They must change. That is where the change must begin from. Or, alternately, every man, woman, and child must study the Quran. Every man, woman, and child, they must understand the Quran. And then, when we have educated people, when they get together, they will have tawasa with half of tawasa with self. Then it becomes easy to build a society that is based upon the Quran, a society that is based upon the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very important. So they recoiled, and then came the reformers. You have the appearance, most of whose names you are familiar with, in India, in Egypt, in Afghanistan, Jamaluddin al Afghani, Abduh, Iqbal, 
Dr. Ali Shariati, all of these came with some knowledge of the West, most of them were trained in the West, and a response to Western civilization <coughs> came about from these sources, not from our traditional ulama, but from the people who had gone to the West, studied them, came back, and they said, let's now go back and revisit and try to reform Islam. But the difficulty with reform is the following. Reform does not work. What works is renewal. Reform does not work. What works is renewal. You must renew your faith. A renewal based upon faith. A renewal based upon righteous action, ihsan, upon justice. A renewal based upon working together, not fighting together. We are very good at that. <laughs> but working together. A renewal based upon working together. For what? For justice. For the truth. <clears throat> truth meaning a scientist looks for truth in his way. A philosopher looks for truth in his way. Philosophy and science received a big blow with Ghazali. There's no question about it. Ever since then, there has been an anti-intellectual stream in Islam. When, you, when the Muslims get together, how many Muslims discuss what to do in the area of science? How many of them discuss what to do in the area of changing history? They do discuss what to do in the area of religion. We are so bogged down with nitty gritty down to whether or not I should paint my nails. We are very good at that. Splitting it. That's what happened to us. The Quran is so wide, so broad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the Quran. It talks about nature, it talks about history, it talks about the history of the prophets, it talks about you and I, it talks about the nafs, it talks about the mind, it talks about how we relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all there, we don't listen to it. Instead, we are bogged down with hair-splitting arguments about things that are not there in the Quran. So, renewal is what is needed. And this renewal must be based on faith. This renewal must be based on the Quran. A few words about the position of women. And that's the last portion of our presentation today. You cannot transform a society with half of the society out somewhere else. Men and women, according to the Quran, are equal participants in the moral well-being of man. They complement each other. The Prophet ﷺ created a society in which men and women could aspire to the fulfillment of their moral obligations before Allah ﷻ. Then came the period of the Sahaba and the complete fulfillment, flowering, of Islamic civilization at the time of Omar Farooq radiallahu At the time of Omar Farooq radiallahu women went to the masjid. How do we know that? There are hadiths related to Hazrat Omar radiallahu <coughs> They used to pray behind the men, always observing the adab of Islam, not violating the adab, always observing the adab of Islam. But the spiritual space was not not denied to them. Women were participants in the economic life of the country. We know how Hazrat Khadija herself was a great tradesperson. At the time of Hazrat Omar Farooq, there were so many women who would visit the marketplace that he appointed a lady. Her name was Hazrat Safa ibn Abdullah. Safa ibn Abdullah as the manager of the marketplace in Medina. Look it up in history books. Hazrat Amr radiallahu anhu. What a great man he was. Just. He used to sleep with the doors to his house open. Anybody could come in. I mean, can you imagine today a king sleeping with the door open to his palace? He used to walk around at night. He used to say, you know, I wish 
my mother had not given me birth because this uh, uh, this tremendous load that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put on my shoulders because I have to be just Umar Farooq the title Farooq was given to him by the Prophet it comes from the word Faraha that is the criteria to distinguish right from wrong because he was a man of justice justice for women and justice for men and later women were great scholars if you read the travels of Ibn Battuta you find that he stayed and learned from so many great <clears throat> women scholars. One of them in Damascus. Her name was Sita Zahida. It's written in his Rehla. And then, all the way even in India when he came there in 1336. What happened was this. The first blow came with the Harijites. <coughs> the Hawaii Harijites. The Harijites, I went over it briefly the other day, walked away from Hazrat Ali and then they took an oath that they were going to assassinate Hazrat Ali, Hazrat Muawiyah, and Amr bin al all three of them. They were successful in assassinating Hazrat Ali, but the other two escaped. So after that, Muawiyah got himself a bodyguard. I'll trace for you the history of how women slowly but surely were excluded from religious, social, and other spaces. The first blow came from the Harijites. So he got himself a bodyguard, and up until that point, the Khalifa used to lead the prayer. And Muawiyah stopped leading the prayer. He got himself a bodyguard. Then came the time of the Abbasids, and the Persian influence came to dominate. The Persians Persian Empire was a Persian Empire. And the courts of the Abbasids were known for their pleasantries. And the ulama said, this is not good. We have to protect our women. They said, let's put some more restrictions. Let's protect our women. So there was some more of a distance placed between women and their participation in the religious and the social space. This went on for quite a while until the Mongol invasions, and I've covered the Mongol invasions. The Mongols destroyed and they enslaved women. So the ulama said, we are going to protect our women. Let's put them, put a greater distance. Let's protect our women, keep them away from the prying eyes of the enemies. But there was another thing that happened with the, the uh, onset of the so-called Sufi period. The arrival of the Turks, the Indians, the Africans, and the Indonesians into the fold of Islam. Up until the Mongol period, it was the core part of the Islamic world. Arab world, Eastern Turkey, and Iran, and Central Asia that were Muslim and Afghanistan. But after the Mongol period, you have the infusion of Hindu blood, and African blood, and Turkish blood, and Indonesian blood. And out of the Turks and the Indonesians, you find many queens. The Turks, the Turkish women, participated with the men in war. They, they were co-equals with their men. They, their culture was different. They were not exposed to the early history of Islam. So that you have in the 14th century, in the 15th century, <coughs> Queen Razia of India. Razia ruled northern India from 1236 to 1240, an area extending all the way from Bengal to Kabul. And in the following century, there was a succession of five queens in Indonesia who ruled one after the other. And only about 10 years after Razia, there was Shajarat al Dab in Dora, I don't pronounce it correctly, in Egypt. She was the ruler of Egypt for three years. But mostly the Mamluks, the Turks, the Africans, and the Indians. Ibn Battuta, in his travels to the Islamic world, makes that observation. It annoyed him when he saw how easy it was for African women to go in front of the Sheikh and discuss with him issues that would be of concern to them. But this thing, 
changed. And then later, as the Islamic world took its turn towards the Salafi movement, the do's and the don'ts were imposed with greater rigor. And then there was the interlude of the uh, European uh, invasions and colonization, discontinuity. So that gradually, surely but surely, women have been moved away from the religious first and the social and other spheres. So again there, what we need to do is to go back to the purity of the Quran. The purity of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu The purity of the Sahaba. And in the Quran is the, is the uh, ultimate um, solace, ultimate solution to the issues that we are suffering. La hawla hawla haza wa astaghfirullah This is the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to listen to you and learn from you now. Those who were the earliest Muslims, the word Salaf means the earliest ones, who came before us. Ibn Taymiyyah is considered the father of Salafi movement. That's considered. It's just a historical opposition, a religious discussion. It's a historical discussion. In the time I felt uh, one of the reasons why the Muslims um, lost out in their competition with the Mongols was because they had gotten away from the precepts of Islam. He was opposed to, for instance, the teaching of Ibn al Arab, which had to do with the teachings of the heart. In the 18th century, the rise of the Salafi movement was similarly um, due to the feeling on the part of the ulama that the Muslims were falling behind because they were getting away from the pure teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. But in the process of doing so, they put emphasis on the external observations, strict external observations of the Sharia. The Arab world, since it had not encountered the invasions, Mongol invasions, except for Iraq, was much more open to that thinking than was the eastern part of the Islamic world. But nonetheless, the Salafi movement puts emphasis on strict observance of the Sharia literal interpretation of the Sharia, not the spiritual interpretation of the Sharia, and they go too far in negating the lessons of history. For instance, the demolition of graves, the demolition of tombs, the demolition of ancient monuments, and not recognizing the contributions that were made by other schools of thought. They go too far. So uh, that's the, the Salafi meaning as they portrayed the way Islam was understood by the earliest Muslims from their point of view. Then the other schools of thought take the opposite point of view. They look at the period of Prophet Muhammad al and they see spirituality there. Whereas the Salafis say, well, no, this is, this is the way they see it. So it is a question of taking a, a, a colored glass, if you would, the Salafis and the Sufis and the this and that and so on, each one of them has a colored glass. And they put it in there and they say, this is the way the world is. Whereas the Quran is without glasses. It's all of the above. So the Salafis need to come back towards spirituality as a spiritual people need to somehow get rid of some of the excesses that they have accumulated. I hope I answered that question. Yes. Could you also expand on the, the development of Wahhabism? Wahhabism is a part of the Salafi movement. It comes from Sheikh Abdul Wahhab of Najat. He was born in the interior of Arabia. I have written about him in the book. There is an entire chapter about him. Basically, his story was this. He was a scholar. He studied the Quran and the Hadith of the Prophet and he came to the conclusion that people were getting away from the pristine purity of Islam. So he preached, and his initial preachings were not popular. People chased him out. Ultimately, he came to the court of Ibn Saud, 
in Madrid at the time, and through intermarriage, the court of Ibn Saud got um, convinced of what the Sheikh was teaching, and the combination of the teachings of Sheikh Abdul Wahab and the the court of Ibn Saud was a powerful combination. Then they started to preach and expand out. Not only that, they waged war against Muslims. This is the other thing about Salafism. Not only did they say that the other position is wrong, they waged war on them. They think that violence is justified to somehow impose their views on other people. So they waged war on the neighboring sheikhs in the kingdom. So long story short, again, they came into a conflict with the Ottoman Empire, back and forth, up until the First World War, when, with the help of the British, they conquered uh, Hejaz, Makkah and Medina, and uh, made Wahhabism a part of the Arabic culture. It fitted with the culture, the Bedouin culture that they had. And they tried to impose it, and they still try to impose in multiple ways. Now, our point does something in here that is a, is, is a problem with, with some of the things that they teach. I was talking to a scholar who was trained at the University of Medina. He is an imam in a local area. And he said to me, when he was trained 30 years ago, whatever it was, at the University of Medina, it was prohibited to take any pictures. But today, he, go, he said he went to Medina for a visit, and he saw that everybody there, every student, has a selfie, you know, a, 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 a camera with them. So you see, technology is changing now. But why take a position, call it haram one day, and another day it becomes halal? The same way with destroying the historical uh, evidences. Um, leveling of the tombs. What did those dead people do to them? Leave them alone. And imposing their will on other people by means of violence. That is not acceptable. And this, this, this is part of their the, the history. But they are changing. And inshallah, they will change again. Does the values, the things that they value, because it contradicts the Quran and Sunnah, does that make their ideology invalid? I don't know. That's, that's a loaded question. You know, that's something that people who give fatwas, they can take a position. All I can do is to relate to you from a strong perspective. This is what happened. You're a young man. You'll have to. So my advice to you is this. Don't get into the, the, the corner of this is halal, this is halal, this is not valid. Just say this is what happened. And, and stand at that. Because truth stands on its own merits. It's when you say, you know, they're against Islam or something like that. That's when the argument starts. This is what happens. And you can discuss with other people. He says, no, that's not what happened. This is what happened. Take a look at historical uh, occurrences. And then people will make up their own mind. They will say, this is right and this is wrong. Let them decide. That's my good advice to you. And sorry, could you go back to, you mentioned British. Could you talk about that again? Yes. The, uh, no, yeah, British, Britain controlled India. After the First World War, Britain wanted to control all the routes to India. That's why they controlled Palestine and Iraq, because they wanted to have a land route from the Mediterranean through Palestine and Iraq to India. So the British were very much involved with the politics of the remnants of the Ottoman Empire. And they wanted to make sure that their um, people were in control of Hijab. First, it was Sharif Hussein of Makkah. And Sharif Hussein, when he proved to be not so malleable, they replaced him in 1924 with uh, the uh, Saudi um, Emirate. Britain was the queen of the world up until the Second World War. They could do almost anything they wanted to do, especially in that part of the world. So, so in one hand, they were helping uh, more. Oh, the British? No, British, yeah. No. On the other hand, they were, uh, they were helping. The Mughal Empire. No, the Mughal Empire disintegrated long before the British um, appeared. In, in, in the Mughal Empire disintegrated into local um, Nawabs, the Nawab of Bengal. On paper, he paid lip service to the sovereignty of Delhi, but in practice, he was independent. 